Make a retro motorbike and put a European badge on it and it's a surefire way to have a sales success. But things aren't that simple for the Japanese. Just take a look at the Honda CB1100 RS and take a look at the Kawasaki W800. Stunning looking bikes with all of their heritage, but no one wanted them. But there is one bike from Japan that has all of that heritage, that lineage. It sells, importantly, and here's the key. Many, many people think of it as the ultimate retro motorbike. That is, of course, the Kawasaki Z900RS. When this bike came out in 2018, within the first three months of that year, it beat all of the Bonnevilles and all of the BMW R9Ts, and it became the best selling retro in the market. So what I want to find out today, what is it about the big Kawasaki's that we love so much? The specs. 10,600 pounds for a brand new one. It's 109 horsepower, 216 kilos. And they sound quite like market leading figures within the retro category. The original one of these, of course, is the Z1 that came out in 1972. So this is the modern day successor to that bike. Have a look at it, soak it in. The color scheme, the yellow details, the single front headlamp, the beautiful, rear fender on the back here classic 1970s big kawasaki styling there but take a closer look at it and you'll notice a few things you could argue that it's borderline a lazy retro bike because what kawasaki did is they took the bottom end of the frame off the z900 they're big naked and then they adapted the top part of that frame so the tank and the seat could sit flush. And have a look at the engine. Well, that's the Kawasaki Z900 engine, just with a few little design details such as the fins to give it that old school look. So this bike lacks the purity of something like the Bonnevilles, even the Kawasaki W800, of course, the Honda CB1100. It doesn't have that purity to it. It's a completely different beast. If I sit on it, well, that feels more like a super naked or a big naked to me, that huge bulging tank, the aggression that you don't often see in the retro segment. This is a very, very different animal. And just looking at it from a side profile, it's raw aggression. It's an intimidating beast. But the finish, the quality of detail everywhere is just beautiful. The tank, the finish on the, the frame everywhere, just a few retro touches here and there, and the fact that the badges, they're lovely quality badges as well. Brown seat looks absolutely superb. And this is what I see. Let me jump on and show you the dash. So it's got these lovely analog gauges either side with a chrome surround. Turn into the middle and you'll see this display that comes up. The fuel gauge on the side, the engine temperature below, and you can see the odometer at the bottom, but that's a really nice stealth touch. And you turn it off and everything disappears. Right, let's get it out and see what this retro big naked has to offer.
I get it immediately. I know that feeling. This is a big naked. This could just as easily be in the likes of the, the Triumph Speed Triple, the Ducati Monster segment, as it could be in the retro segment. This, for me, is a 2003-like super naked with that level of performance, the big intimidation factor. Now, I know I said earlier that it may be a slightly lazy attempt at a retro bike because it is a hybrid from the Z900, but my Lord, that does not take away from the fact that this is a seriously, seriously handsome beast. You know, presence is a subjective thing. Why does someone walk into a party and everyone immediately respect them and want to hang around them? But whatever that is, this Z900 RS has. The amount of times we've been stopped, pulled over, over for coffee, had people coming over, looking, discussing it. I'm considering making a sign saying, sorry, I don't have time for discussion about the bike because it grabs that much attention. If we have a listen, I forgot to do this. I'll just do a quick exhaust note. Bear in mind, it's got an aftermarket exhaust. That's no relaxed, chilled out retro exhaust note there. That's a, that's a hooligan of a bike exhaust note. The speed, the performance, as you may, as you may have guessed, is rocket-like. Although when you get on the throttle initially, it's very hard to get off smoothly. There's always a, a jarring sensation the second you get onto the throttle. It's a bike that is constantly, desperately wanting to be pushed to the limit and begging for more all the time. It's not the kind of bike you just go out and you're, you're looking around at the scene around you. This bike wants to be pushed. The, the gear change, I would say, is actually, it's not good enough. It doesn't fill you with confidence. The amount of time I, I pull off from somewhere and I'm desperately tapping down and it doesn't actually go into first and then you're going from first up to second. It doesn't have that confident clunk into gear like the Triumphs have done so well. It's not a good enough gear change for such a purposeful bike. But everything else, the suspension is superb. The handling, it turns in from left to right, flicking into corners with the agility or with the agility of a middleweight bike. I could talk about my feelings and the intangible stuff with this. I could say that, yes, maybe it doesn't pull at the heartstrings as much as one of the, the Triumphs or the Royal Enfields. Maybe it doesn't have that out and out retro character, but this bike really is, is too butch to give a damn about any of that. It would slap me in the face if I even considered talking about my feelings and the way I like to feel as I ride a bike. It's far, far too butch of a bike for the likes of that talk. So I think I'm going to forgive it for all of that kind of thing because it's just, it's not that kind of bike. This is a big, powerful, moody beast of a bike and it has to be considered almost differently from 90% of the other retros out there in the market.
competition. I, I can't compare any of the Bonnevilles, or at least I can't compare the T120, I can't compare the Triumph T100, I certainly can't compare any of the Royal Enfields here with the big Kawasaki because it would be like Deontay Wilder fighting a lightweight. It just would not be fair. It would be a slaughtering and it would be a total mismatch. The only ones I'm going to have a brief overlook at here are the only ones really that can compete with that Kawasaki. That's the BMW R9 T slash BMW R9 T Pure, which is the simpler model the Yamaha XSR 900 and the Triumph Speed Twin 1200. If I look at the BMW, exactly the same horsepower, even, even the pure model BMW is a thousand pounds more than the Kawasaki. So the Kawasaki offers the same horsepower, less weight, and a thousand pounds less than the pure model, pushing three to four thousand less than the, the upgraded R9T model. That's a huge difference in price. Triumph Speed Twin 1200. Although that's 250cc more than the Kawasaki, the Kawasaki feels much more substantial. It feels like you're riding a heavyweight almost compared to a middleweight between the two of them. So if you're the kind of rider that prefers a scalpel, you'll be looking at something like the Triumph Speed Twin 1200 because it's much more lithe, it's much more slim than the big Kawasaki. But if you're looking for that brutish power and force, then the Kawasaki will be much more the kind of bike for you. Moving on to the Yamaha XSR 900. Well, that's really a retro in the very, very loosest possible sense of the term. There's an argument to say that that almost is not a retro with regards to this style. That's a thoroughly modern bike. However, it's pushed the game on with regards to horsepower. It's about seven horsepower more even than the big Kawasaki. It's also the exact same price as the Kawasaki and lighter than it. So if I look at all of these bikes together, what does that tell me? Well, it tells me that Yamaha, or it tells me that the Japanese, sorry, are still doing exactly what the Japanese have always done, making the best possible bike for the best possible money. The two Japanese bikes here are both the cheapest bikes out of the four of them, and they both have the most amount of horsepower, and they both have the least amount of weight out of the bikes. So you get the most bang for your buck from the Japanese bikes. And if we look at the resale values, the residuals, interesting to note that this Kawasaki here, same year, 2017, 2018 year model, it commands the exact same premiums for a four to five year old bike as the BMW R9T Pure, even though the R9T Pure is a thousand pounds more expensive from new. So it's got fairly rock solid residuals, that Kawasaki. When I passed my biking test about 12 years ago, I was working in a warehouse on the night shift and every evening I'd ride my Suzuki RF600 over to the warehouse and parked outside the warehouse was my friend's Tony, Tony's Kawasaki Z1100. It would have been late 70s, early 80s. Huge green monster, beast of a bike. Intimidation factor and scale just on another level. And I remember thinking, I wonder if one day I'll be good enough to tame a beast like that. See, it was the danger element of it that makes it cool, that intimidation factor. And here now, the modern day equivalent of that bike, it's got all of that intimidation factor. It's got all of the, the danger factor that made that original Z and those Zs of the 70s and 80s such beasts. And it's what gives them that reputation and I'm delighted after riding this, I, I get that exact same feeling as I did from those 70s and 80s Z bikes. The retro market's a funny thing. I could look, for example, at this, the Z900 RS, 
Well, it's a 900cc retro bike. And then I could also look at the, the Triumph Speed Twin 900. Well, that's a 900cc retro bike. Admittedly, the Kawasaki has more power, but they're still both 900cc retros. So surely they'll still be there or thereabouts, similar kinds of bike, giving me the same kind of sensation. But let me put it like this, if I can, in a human context. Imagine I'm a landlord and I'm looking for a new tenant to move into my property. Two gentlemen come over as prospective tenants. Mr. Kawasaki Z900RS and Mr. Triumph Speed Twin 900. Both of them beautifully dressed, very elegant looking. But I can see Mr. Z900RS under his perfectly fitted suit. He's someone that works out a lot. And I can see just under his blazer collar, he's got a tattoo there. So I'm thinking, hmm, this guy, this guy has some edge about him. Then I look at their hobbies and what they're interested in. Well, Mr. Triumph loves reading the National Geographic and, and drinking single origin coffee. But Mr. Kawasaki, well, he trains in mixed martial arts and enjoys a good night out. But I fancy a bit of excitement. And Mr. Kawasaki sounds infinitely more fun and entertaining than Mr. Triumph. So I end up picking Mr. Kawasaki as my new flatmate. The problem is, after a week, I realise that Mr. Kawasaki has a steroid problem and he's busy training for illegal bare-knuckle boxing fights underground in London. I also find out that he really, really enjoys nights out, often a little too much. So I end up living in a roller coaster situation. Someone who's roided up almost 24 seven and is constantly angry and hungover all the time. It's a high maintenance flatmate. And I find myself wishing I could just go back, change my mind and have a simple time drinking a coffee with Mr. Triumph. So while it does sound fun living with a roided up party animal, I just know for me, it would probably get tiresome in the end. Look, you can put a thug in a smart suit, but it will still be a thug in a smart suit. However, I will say this, if, if I'm looking for a good night out and I've got both Mr. Triumph and Mr. Kawasaki on speed dial, I know who I'm calling first.